Tonight on EWTN Live, we'll see how the legacy of St. Jose Maria Escriva is helping young people with limited access to economic and educational opportunities receive academic support and encouragement in their Christian life. So please stay with us. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. I'm Father Mitch Packo. Welcome to EWTN Live, where we bring you guests from all over the world. Before we get to tonight's guests, I want to mention that today is the great feast of St. Thomas Aquinas. He was born in 1225, and he was destined, his family were minor nobles, and they wanted him to be a priest. His older brothers would take care of the castle and all, but they wanted him to go off to the uh, Benedictines because there was a very wealthy Benedictine monastery and that would be good for the family. Well, he felt attracted to the Dominicans who were very poor order. And they locked him up. They put uh, a woman of ill repute in there with him for a while, locked her in there, and he chased her away with a, a lighted torch. And they knew that he really was called to be a Dominican. And what a gift. As he studied under St. Albert the Great, he learned well. He was known by the, the students as the dumb ox because he didn't say much. But St. Albert saw through all that. It said, someday this ox will bellow and the whole world will listen. And it's not only the whole world of his day, but all the way down to this time. He is always well worth reading and studying. And when you think the great amount and depth of thought that he accomplished by the time he died at age 49, it is just astounding what he has accomplished. So we give thanks to God for him and for our Dominican brothers and sisters uh, to whose order he belonged. Now, our guests tonight are working to help young people and their families by reinforcing the dignity of their person and recognizing parents as the primary educators of their children. Following the model of Opus Dei and the legacy of its founder, St. Jose Maria Escriva. They're helping inner city youth with limited access to economic and educational opportunities find their way toward academic success, as well as strengthening virtues through works of mercy. One place where this happens is in the inner city of Chicago, where students from over 125 public, parochial, and independent schools look to the Midtown Educational Foundation and the Metro Achievement Center, both inspired by Opus Dei for help. Let's take a quick look at their mission in this little video clip. Where I live, it's not really a good neighborhood. It's known for gangs, violence, a lot of drugs. You know, there's a lot of gangs in my neighborhood. We have one at the park, you know, a couple years ago. There were some shootings there. I don't really like to be a part of that at all. This program is a good thing to guide them into the right direction. MEF is a place where your children can grow academically and morally. It is a unique place. It is, it is unlike anything I have ever seen before. I think it's very important to get the kids in the middle because those kids have the potential 
to be A plus students? I would say I was probably a C average student. The more I was attending Midtown, my grades started rising steadily and being one of the first in my family to attend college is definitely a huge accomplishment for me. first year he was in school, I was so disappointed. <laughs> this year, his grades went up, he had straight A's. Metro has helped me get perfect attendance, all A's. I struggled in math a lot, and then when I came to Midtown, I got better, got A's. So I've improved my grades to a standard that I didn't think I reached before. Without Metro, I wouldn't be a college grad. Without Metro, I wouldn't want to continue that education a step further. Midtown has taught me virtues. 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 A lot of virtues. A lot of character. Character. Character development. The fact that there's such a focus on it here, I think, will have a huge impact on their ability to be successful going forward as young leaders. This is changing people's lives. It's the people who surround you, the people who cherish you, the people who want you to become someone in life. MEF does a great job of getting them excited, not just about school, but about life. In the parent involvement part of the program, I learned, one, a lot of things about myself, and then, two, a lot of things about kids. We were so impressed with the program that, you know, we just haven't stopped coming. Metro has helped me blossom into the person I am today and who I will become into the future. They have my back, like, they encourage me, and of course I'm going to be going to college. It is a, a proven track record here that you would be hard-pressed to find anywhere else. Here to tell us more about the work of Midtown and Metro and the inspiration they receive from Opus Dei, please welcome the director of the Metro Achievement Center for Girls, Erin Aldrich, and the Opus Dei director of Youth Outreach, Angela Reckhart. Good to see you, Erin. How do you do? Good to see you. Nice to have both of you here. Thank you. Angela, you actually live in New York City. Yes. And Aaron, you are the one working in Chicago, correct? correct? Yes. Now, this is uh, an outreach by Opus Dei. To understand that, what is Opus Dei and how does this connect? Opus Dei is a Catholic institution that was founded by St. Josemaria Scriva in 1928. And its mission is to help people find ways to bring God into their daily activity. Um, and through that, through growing in relationship with God, they also discover ways to serve others around them and improve in society, improve society in what they do. Opus Dei is Latin for work of God. And I think that points to something um, about the, the nature of Opus Dei, that it's something that God has wanted for his church and for the world. St. Rosemary Scriva said that on 19, in October 2nd, 1928, he, he saw Opus Dei, God showed it to him. It wasn't his idea, but God wanted this message of the universal call to holiness that everyone is called to be a saint in his church once more. It, I mean, it's a message that was there with the first Christians. Um, but this was a way for him to sort of highlight it mm -hmm. at a time and, and it's amazing to me when you know more about Opus Dei is how in 1928, Saint Jose Maria Escriva was talking about things that would really get institutionalized in Vatican II. Yes. Way before the council, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. almost 50 years. So, and you're both members? Yes. Now, one of the, the things you are doing this work in Chicago. Yes. How does this connect with the Opus Dei mission and, and purpose and goals? Mm -hmm. So Opus Dei, again, as Angie had said, is trying to help people in the middle of the world learn how to take their ordinary and By the tasks. middle of the world, you don't mean in the middle of each continent or something. <laughs> no. You mean uh, who, in the midst of In the midst yeah, of everyday, everyday activity. Okay. So taking their, the circumstances that they're in and learning how to make them holy. And so the first step 
um, that we see at Metro is by educating students in virtue because virtue is good and virtue is going to lead to God. And we want to educate the whole person and truly teach them how to use their freedom, which is something St. Jose Maria um, and the church at large has have really, I mean, God gave us freedom. And we really want to develop that in all of our students so that they can make the choices that they need mm -hmm. to become better in life. Can I give an example of how this might play out? Will it make it more clear? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Very much so. And so we teach girls the meaning of friendship and that in order to be a good friend, you need to be loyal, you need to care, you need to spend time with someone. And one of our students recently graduated and went to Northwestern. Which is a... University in Chicago. Yeah, uh, actually in Evanston. And yes. A very, very high quality yes. university. Yes, yes That's yes. not community college, yep. this is... Uh, yes. one of the Ivy League kind yes. level schools. Which, that's exciting in and of it itself, is, but... That's why I emphasize <laughs> that. The, um, while she was there, she really wanted to be in a sorority because she wanted to have the same closeness of friendships that she had had at Metro. Um, girls that were challenging her to be, challenging her to be better and where she could really confide in them. And when she got to the sorority, she realized, this isn't what's happening. Um, in fact, they're drinking a lot. They're leaving each other alone um, after they've drank a lot and things are going to, I don't know what's going to happen there. And so she was very... Uh, excuse me, I know. <laughs> it's going to get out of control because they've been drinking <laughs> exactly. oftentimes with the boys from the fraternities. Yes, exactly. And so she, on her own initiative, decided, you know, I'm not going to complain about this. Instead, I'm going to do something. And so she spent the last two years starting a new sorority on their campus, which really embodies what true friendship is and that loyalty and service and taking the things that she learned from Metro and the virtues and the talents that realizing what she has and bringing them to, this is, to the area she's in now. Yeah. It's, uh, I'm glad you brought this up because today is the feast of St. Thomas. And St. Thomas uses the virtues as the basis of morality and moral teaching. Mm -hmm. That was one of his real uh, genius insights. So here you have students that are living out mm -hmm. to mystic moral theology uh, and making an impact. Mm -hmm. uh, besides the school uh, in Chicago where Aaron is working, are there other similar situations that Opus Dei folks are working in? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's a similar but smaller program in the Bronx. Um, one for the girls is called Rosedale and Cretona for the boys. And then um, we also have in, in D.C. PALS and TAPS. So these are... Yeah, that's Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm, Washington, D.C. And then, but there are other initiatives that people inspired by the message of Opus Dei have. Um, so, for example, parents have come together and, and um, started schools, different schools in, in Chicago, in Boston, in DC, uh, that again are on this um, teach Christian virtue in and through a normal school setting. Um, and then they have various different other initiatives. One that I, especially close to my heart because I lived there, was, um, is Bay Ridge Residents in Boston. This is an independent student residence for university women. Um, and being inspired by the message of Opus Dei, they don't only provide a room and a meal plan, but they really see the staff there wants to contribute, complement to the education that they're getting um, in school, a holistic education. So, if, uh, for example, there's a girl who um, moved there for one semester, and at the end of that semester, she got straight A's in school, which is something that she hadn't done yet in college. And she attributed it to the fact that in order to go down to the dining room to eat breakfast, she had to get dressed. That was a rule that Bay Ridge had to show respect for the staff and the other people there. Couldn't come down in your pajamas mm -mm. or your nightgown. Nope. <laughs> but because she was already dressed, after breakfast, she didn't go back to bed. She sat down and studied. Come on. I know. It's Are amazing. you serious? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
yeah, students actually studied. <laughs> but see, that's that type of thing, a way of um, instilling that, that virtue, those good habits to, to make good choices. Here's, you know, and this one of the things, when you said that the parents are starting schools, you mean, are they beginning new schools or are they working within existing schools? You know, their parents both. do both. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The, what I was referring to were um, groups of parents, some of them members of the work, some of them not, but all of them understanding um, the, the message of seeking holiness in ordinary life and helping young women, young men become Christians who are consistent with their vocation to bring Christ to all activities. Now, here's the question. If the students are already in a public school, are the parents allowed to do that kind of teaching of virtue? Is that permitted? Well, I think a lot, I mean... I mean, inside the school, of course, oh, at home. Right. But you know, inside the school, uh, would they be allowed to go into a, a, a public school and teach that virtue, or do they have to start an alternative school? I think to um, instill that those types of virtues and in, in a broad vision of faith, you'd have to start other schools. Yeah, because mm -hmm. I don't think it's permitted mm -mm. to teach the virtues mm -hmm. you know, in the public school. Uh, uh, seriously, yeah. I, mean, uh, I, I run, but it's, it, it's, there's no, uh, the virtues ultimately mm -hmm lead to theological questions about mm -hmm. God mm -hmm. as the source of virtue. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's permitted to do that in a public school. Mm -hmm. It's hard to get to the point of yeah. the objective good when yeah. you can't state that God exists. Yeah, um, exactly. So. Or that there is a good mm -hmm. and an evil. That's, that's not easy mm -hmm. to say those yeah. things yeah. in the public forum. Mm -hmm. It's just not politically correct. So that, that so this is really a major alternative mm -hmm. to what's going on. One of the statistics that was in that little clip is that only 42 percent of kids in the public schools mm -hmm. graduate in mm -hmm. Chicago. It's gone up. That is, I think, two years old. So okay. I think it's closer to 47 or 52. It's <laughs> I don't remember the exact number, but oh, it has gone up a little, <laughs> just so that Chicago knows. Um, yeah. They're doing better. <laughs> good, good. good um, yeah. yeah. I have to start somewhere, but mm -hmm. it's th this is a problem here yes. in Birmingham. It, it's a it's a national problem. Mm -hmm. it sounds like y'all are trying to do something to counteract that that quality. Mm -hmm. Now, in, in, uh, besides you two, how many other? folks from Opus Dei, and when you said the work, you mean Opus Dei is the work, the right? Work, the yes. English word. Mm -hmm. How many others are doing this in Opus Dei? Um, well, I don't have exact numbers, but I know uh, there are around 90,000 members of Opus Dei in the world and a 3,000 in the United States. But there are many, many more people who appreciate Opus Dei and are, have decided to be associated with it. They're cooperators of Opus Dei, so mm -hmm. they can, and we've got many different types of cooperators. They, we even have um, non-Catholic and non-Christian cooperators, mm -hmm. people who recognize the importance of virtue or the, the good social works mm -hmm. that have been inspired by the message of Opus Dei, and they want to contribute to that. Right, right, right. Do you have that going on in the Chicago uh, schools? The fact that we have many different people working together. Um, uh, but also people who are not even Catholic. You have uh -huh. non-Catholics as well as Catholics. Yes. Members of Opus Dei and non-members. Mm -hmm. They're all working together. Yes, and so at Metro Achievement Center where I work, um, we don't ask anyone what faith they are when they apply or when they're applying for the, a job or if they're applying to come to our programs. And so students of all faiths come together sure. and are learning together these virtues that are going to help them to become better citizens. Now, though the students are from a variety of religious mm -hmm. backgrounds and you don't ask, which yep. is a, a good thing, you know, mm -hmm. just, just take who comes. 
Do they know that you are a Catholic organization? Yes, they're very aware. We have each family that comes, we have an interview with each of them and explain our mission in its entirety. We very strongly support that the parents are the primary educators of their children and would never want their children learning things that they disapprove of. Mm -hmm. And so um, we have a beautiful chapel in our center. The Boys Center similarly has a beautiful chapel. Um, we have Catholic priests of Opus Dei that come and teach Christian doctrine to parents that want their kids to take a part of something beyond just the human virtue and bring it to a faith-based virtue. Um, and so those um, are taught in our chapel. The priest also, while he's there, stays for confession and spiritual direction. And they really learn how to take these virtues into their spiritual life. And do... Um uh, about how many or about what percentage of the students would agree, the parents would say, mm -hmm. yeah, you can go to the religious formation mm -hmm. classes? So about 85% okay. to 90% mm -hmm. are enrolled in our Christian education program. I would say from what we can gather, about 60% of our families are Catholic. Mm -hmm. And then we know that 10 to 15% are not Christian just by when they tell us things. Sure, sure. Okay. So, so you, get, you get a sense of um, th that diversity and the, you respect mm -hmm. their conscience, mm -hmm. you know, which is extremely important. Mm -hmm. you know, this, that is Catholicism at its best. Mm -hmm. You offer the faith, mm -hmm. but you respect their mm -hmm. conscience. I want to show a clip okay. of one of the uh, alumni. There's a young woman, her name is Lepre Crawford. Yes. And she uh, won uh, a great scholarship, um, but I guess Erin, you would know more about it. Mm -hmm. uh, who is she and what's, <laughs> what is she up to? What's going on yeah, here? So LaPree just graduated last year. She is at Tougaloo College in Mississippi, so only four hours from here, but too much distance for us to actually have seen each other today. Um, but she's doing very well. She's in a choir in her college. She's on their dance team. She wants to become a nurse. Um, she never knew her father, and her mother passed away as she was entering high school. Who's been raising her? An aunt. Oh, um, God bless and the so it, it's very impressive because when you see the neighborhood that she's from, and we've dropped her off in that neighborhood before. It, I mean, it's very impressive where she is in her life right now. So with her, given the background, because mm -hmm. that that's so that's some serious strikes against you. Yes. You know, your father mm -hmm. shows no care. Mm -hmm. Your mother passes away. Mm -hmm. Tough neighborhood. Yep. Anybody else in her family ever go to college? Not. I mean, not that I know of. Okay. All right. Uh, we're going to go take a look at LaPree right now. we got a little clip. Good evening. Okay. Fight for your life because no one will do it for you is my motto. Most people see me in the halls or outside walking to the bus with a smile on my face. But the thing is, I was not always happy like this. I come from a place where there weren't many opportunities and lived in a bad neighborhood. I always had a bad attitude. I never saw or even looked towards the bright side of life. I lived in an apartment with my mother, and every Mother and Father's Day, I made her card and told her thanks for all she had done for me. My mother was really nice. She had an unstoppable smile, and I think that's where I get mine from. <laughs> she was always sick in and out of the hospital. There are some days when I stayed in the hospital with her because no one could watch me. The summer before eighth grade graduation, my mother passed away. She had lupus and her kidneys gave out on her. Entering eighth grade, I really didn't care about myself, my values, nor my education. I got into fights at school and got suspended for them. I got into fights not because I didn't like the girls, but because I hated my life. When my aunt told me about Metro, I'm not gonna lie, I didn't want to go, but, <laughs> but I'm glad I did. Once I came to Metro, I felt like I was just getting through life, but gradually I started opening up. By coming to Metro, I learned about my values, self-respect, and simply being a woman of virtue. I've learned how to be nice to those around me and to not be naive. 
and I learned how to make good choices and stand by them. I've also realized the importance of education and how it's the key to a better future. This past spring, I was awarded the Patricia McDonald Jordan Scholarship, which made possible my goal to be the first in my family to attend college. Because of Metro's unending opportunities, I was able to regain my drive and ambition back. I am now a freshman at Tougaloo College in Jackson, Mississippi, and plan to study nursing. I am so glad to be here tonight to share my story with you and to express how utterly grateful I am to be a proud alum of Metro Achievement Center. Thank you. You know, this is somebody who is a victim of bad decisions and of life's messiness like lupus is horrible, horrible disease, and was becoming self-destructive. This is amazing what, she's, what she has found, because it's not just she's getting educated, the virtues you talked about. She seems to have gotten it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's absolutely fantastic. The, what you're saying about freedom reminded me, St. Jose Maria always considered himself, a, and rightly so, a great defender of freedom, yes. freedom of consciences. Um, and he made sure that in the centers of formation, the centers of Opus Dei, that the, the people of Opus Dei wouldn't coerce meaningly or, un, or un, um, unintentionally say things that might hinder somebody from speaking their mind um, in things that that there isn't a clear answer from of mo faith and morals um, but that he always that people follow their conscience people follow, uh, make good use of their freedom because freedom is what makes it makes us able to love and that's what's important and again the lepre is someone who radiates she's not just yeah. making it through mm -hmm. she's radiating mm -hmm. back mm -hmm. that's that talks about transformation mm -hmm. and i think you know chicago mm -hmm. has become infamous for the the danger to youth yeah. you know it's a very dangerous place especially for african-american youth yeah. who are victimized by other african-american youth it's horrible mm -hmm. and you know to to see that this is a mission not only for clergy, but for the for the laity, mm -hmm. like y'all are doing. This the, that's where we have to be back again, mm -hmm. looking mm -hmm. to the city, not as a place to flee, yeah. but the place of mission. Mm -hmm. Well, and as you said, with the mission of the laity, I think one of the things that we try to do at Metro and all the different things that we do through Opus Day is giving these women a deep sense that they have a responsibility to spread the truth that they know and those that take advantage of the Christian side of things to share the faith that they know with others. Um, and so, I mean, there are many, many great stories of kids that have taken what they've learned and shared it with others. Yeah, yeah. And you see this in the other centers as well, in the other parts of the country. Definitely, oh, definitely. Let's see, this is, one of the things that is a great hope, mm -hmm. you know, because um, uh, it's just, I always like to compare that uh, our culture to the period of the barbarian invasions of Europe. Mm -hmm. And when the, the Roman government absolutely collapsed and failed and could not stop the barbarity, it was the church converting the barbarians that changed them from barbarians to Europeans. Mm -hmm. And this is what y'all are doing. Mm -hmm. And it really, it works along those, um, the crossroads of your normal professional relationships, family relationships, social relationships. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's, that's where the message, the message of the gospel comes across. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Well, we're going to take a little bit of a break. Again, I want to let you know the um, Midtown Educational Foundation uh, in Chicago, uh, is uh, you can go to their website, which is www.midtown-metro.org. Midtown-metro.org. 
metro.org, or they have a number, with the old Chicago <laughs> prefix of 312-738-8300. See, I, that, I remember when they, mm -hmm. we first had those area codes, yep. we got them. Uh, also, you can go to opusdei.org, uh, and that's another place to find out more about them. We're going to take our break now and come back in a couple of minutes. I want to get your phone calls, your comments and questions, as well as those of our studio audience, so please stay with us. Thank you, thank you, welcome back. First of all, uh, we'd like to invite all of you to come over here on pilgrimage. Uh, if you can be part of our EWTN family right here in Irondale, Alabama, uh, you are most welcome. Uh, you can contact our pilgrimage department at 205-271-2966 or go to our website EWTN.com. They will give you all kinds of information about uh, the scheduling of masses, programs you can attend, uh, places to stay, directions to the Shrine of the Most Blessed Sacrament up in Hansville where the sisters are, uh, good places to eat um, besides the kitchen here. Uh, you got you know your uh, great hamburger heaven and it's part of the religious theme of our restaurants around here. Uh, Golden Rule barbecues, that's religious theme. And then, uh, you know, we've also got the uh, Arndell Cafe, where the home of the fried green tomatoes. That movie yeah. is about right down the street here. Yeah, the book is written down here. So we'd love to have you come and join us. You ready for some questions and comments? Yes. Let's go come on. It. Sir, where are you from? I'm from uh, Wilkerson, Washington, in That's Washington State. In Washington State. Good That's to have good you here. Family. And you had some of those fried green tomatoes today. Absolutely. Were they fine. any good? Excellent, excellent. Good. I enjoyed good. it. I grew up with fried green tomatoes. <laughs> yes. yeah. They did a good job here in Alabama. Right. So what's your question? Uh, my question is, um, I, I grew up in New Orleans as a kid when poverty was, um, uh, you know, we didn't know the difference. But today, in Chicago, in New York, in the big cities, when the kids are, have tremendous peer pressure from the rappers and et cetera, how do you reach them to talk about things in the Bible or anything Christian? I mean, how would you do that? Mm -hmm. yeah, thanks, great question. Because that, that, is that yeah. not one of the big issues? You know, by the time a kid becomes early teens, they're less influenced by their family than by their peers. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with that peer pressure? Yes, so in many of our programs in Midtown and Metro, we have mentors that meet with them, each student individually. So they're probably in their 20s, 30s. The mentors are not mm -hmm. the students. Correct, okay. the mentors that are working with the students are in their 20s and 30s. and are able to really reinforce this idea of virtue. And these women emulate the love of God. And these girls, when they encounter love, they respond. And our hope is that each girl, when they enter a center, is going to experience the love of God. 
And with that, they're going to be able to see that they have the freedom to make many choices, good or bad. But when they make the good ones, that they have that positive reinforcement and they, ha they see that they're on a journey to where they want to go. So in many of the other activities initiatives, there is this mentoring component or this accompaniment component. And one of the girls after a week long program, she said that it was to prepare for high school. She said the favorite part was the mentoring because somebody actually listened to her and helped her solve her problems. I think that's what people are looking for is that outreach hand in friendship, mm -hmm. um, mm, accepting the person as she is with all her defects and mess ups, but seeing the good that is in here because we see her with the eyes of Christ. Mm -hmm. um, so that requires prayer on the part of anybody who's wanting to help. But then when she experiences that love, she realizes that she is someone who is lovable. And hopefully again, that that love brings her to love with a capital L, which is the love of God. You know, one of the things, because the question was uh, very appropriate. Um, one of the qualities of the peer pressure is not love, but usually control, mm -hmm. you know, that, that, that the, the peers are controlling and oftentimes controlling in order to use, not help the other person develop. Mm -hmm. That would be different from the, the uh, uh, mentors. Correct. Yeah. The mentors yeah. are encouraging them to explore their talents, encouraging them to seek what is good. Um, in, it's a lot of the same themes that they would have heard from their parents, but it's not from their parent when they decide they want to stop listening to their parents because yes. they're teenage girls. <laughs> or boys. Yes, in the either other way. School. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and that's uh, something that also, when, when you have the mentors, do you have African-American mentors with African-American kids, white mentors with white kids, Hispanic mentors with Hispanic kids? No. Um, St. Jose Maria very much saw that there is one race, the children of God. And so the way we run our centers is that each person is a child of God. Our mentoring, nothing has to do with race. We're trying to bring people from all different races, different creeds, even different. I mean, we have a lot of immigrants from different countries right now that are part of our programs. And we treat them all the same because we see them all as a child of God. Yeah. Yeah, see, that's, that's key. I, I uh, had a very moving experience at a prison ministry in Texas back in November. And th it was the same there, that breaking down d d the race issue mm -hmm. was just nonsense. They were friends mm -hmm. with each other. Mm -hmm. and didn't matter uh, if they're black, Hispanic, or white. That's mm -hmm. an absurdity yeah. to divide us. Yeah. So One of our students just recently is also in her freshman year of college, one of LaPree's friends, in fact. And she's in a school that's predominantly Caucasian. And she said that the cafeteria is split. The whites sit on one side and minorities sit on the other side. And she didn't realize this when she got there because she's just used to seeing people as people. So went and sat on that side and other people came to her and were like, what are you doing? This isn't where you should be sitting. And she's like, yeah, it is. And just kept <laughs> going. And things have started to change since then because she just understood we're all the same. So that the, her virtuous realization of the human race as mm -hmm. the bottom line yep. helped others see the mm -hmm. same. Exactly. I like it. Let's uh, go on to another question. Hello, Mary Ann. Hi, Father Paco. How are you? Fine, thanks. And uh, what is your question? Uh, my question is I'm calling for my brother. He, he didn't ask me to ask this question, but I'm going to ask it on his behalf. He's a CCD teacher, and he's teaching uh, kids between probably 7 to 12 years old. And he's having a difficult time, and he's such a wonderful, wonderful person, and he's so committed to the faith, but he's having a difficult time trying to um, find materials that will spark uh, the love and the beauty and the majesty of our faith in these kids. He's getting the old uh, blank-eyed stare. And he's tried everything, and I was hoping maybe your guests might be able to suggest some materials, whether it's videos or literature or something that will actually – set these kids, get a spark going in these kids to really appreciate the, the beauty and the, the, the majesty of our Catholic faith. 
Thanks, Marianne. What do you think of that? What came to my mind was um, something that we've used a lot to help young people have a relationship, start a relationship, a personal relationship with Jesus. And I mean, that happens through prayer, but sometimes you need to step up, you know, to get training wheels to help you pray. And we find that in spiritual reading. So um, finding books that can display the life of Christ in a way that is accessible to them. So one book I have used for young people is, um, I don't even know the author, I just, I have the, the image of the cover in my head, is The Gospel According to Pup Pup. So it's gospel according, according to, to Pup Pup. So it's this little puppy dog that is adopted by Jesus and accompanies him as he goes along his public ministry so it's it's really living the gospel as another person in the scene, which is what Opus, which is what Saint Jose Maria said, is so important to to have that personal friendship with Christ. We have to really rub elbows with him, and that only happens with the gospel. Well, see, recommending uh, a dog as a friend of Jesus is so appropriate on the feast of a Dominican. <laughs> Do you know why? No. Because they make a pun. Dominicanus means, if you take, divide the word apart, the dog of the Lord. Mm -hmm. and, and, so, and so that's why St. Dominic has a uh, black and white dog uh, with a lot of it, the pictures of him. He's often depicted with a black and white dog, with those uh, the ones from Dalmatians. Mm -hmm. Usually a Dalmatian because they wear black and white too. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and that is the, the dog of the Lord is uh, sort of a pun on their name. So it's very appropriate, <laughs> very appropriate. Uh, but that'd be one thing. And, and sometimes too, interspersing, I, I think you're, you're onto something with, but perhaps also interspersing the doctrine side with more stories. This one, uh, pup pup. Mm -hmm. the gospel according gospel to gospel according to pup pup. And um, you know, with the little kids, like seven, eight year olds, um, the Chronicles of Narnia mm -hmm. by C. S. Lewis, combined with some other you know, books of catechism, work well. I used to teach mere Christianity mm -hmm. after I had my students read a couple of Chronicles of Narnia. Mm -hmm. And they, uh, remember they would start to say, the stuff in this book is sort of like those novels. I said, <laughs> I taught freshmen, so I have to say, um, did you look at the name of the author of both books? Oh, it's the same guy, you know, the, so, so the, you know, but the, the stories baptize the imagination. And then the intellect can go in and understand better when it's got an imaginative sense. So those would be some things, Marianne, to maybe try. Lives of saints, of course, always good. We have another caller. Hello, John. Hello, Father. Hey, how are you? What, what can we do for you today? Uh, I'd like to hear both uh, of the guests individually share uh, a short story of something they know where the Opus Dei ministers uh, could... Uh, minister spirituality or the gospel to someone. Okay. Yeah. Um, again, it's about being ordinary Christians, ordinary people in the midst of the world. So um, spreading the gospel through what we spend most of our day doing, mainly work. I remember um, one woman store manager. She had been coming. She's not actually even in Opus Dei, but she had been coming to means of formation, learning about this, the Christian vocation that everybody is called to be a saint and thinking about these things. And one of the things she realized is, well, before she would avoid, you know, the, you know, a lot of people come over with questions or issues and, she, you know, she'd tell which ones were very complicated, which ones are going to be a little more difficult to try to avoid them. But since receiving that formation, that training, she um, she started seeking them out, seeing that each one there is Christ in each one of those people. So, in serving the most difficult cases, I'm serving Christ, and those people may never know what her motive was, but that is crowning her work with the cross of Christ. 
the same woman um, in the store knew that one of the, he's a special needs man who's working, uh, rounding up shopping carts, bagging groceries, that sort of thing. She knew that both he and his mother had fallen away from the Catholic faith. So she started just in the midst of work, you know, sharing things in a very natural way, as you would share with somebody that you care about, the joys that she had of, of knowing Jesus, of um, living the faith. And little by little, he would go home and he would tell his mother what she'd been saying. And eventually, both he and his mother started practicing the faith. Yeah. So that'd be just, again, you don't have to have a great big tent evangelistic meeting. You one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. with the people right around you. Um, and so I was going to say something where Opus Dei also does offer formation to many people, people that are not members of Opus Dei, but anyone that wants to attend. And there are um, things called recollections, which are mini retreats. They're two hours once a month. And I had a friend that attended one of these recollections. There's time for prayer. And then there's also a talk that's always very practical of putting your faith into action. And the topic had something to do with sanctifying your family life. So as a woman, being a wife and a mother is something that is going to bring you to holiness and doing those well. And so I'm this person's friend. And so she came to talk to me and she's like, wow, I'm realizing after this that, you know, me and my husband have become very distant and I can't figure out why. Can you help me think about this? So um, we were thinking, I was over at her house and I noticed that her kitchen table is always full of laundry and mail. And I said, you know, where do you guys eat dinner? She's like, oh, usually on the couch, we're so tired. And so we just put on the TV, you know, he never really wants to sit at the table. I said, well, what if you cleared the table and you know, said it, he's naturally going to come there and you two are going to be forced to talk to each other. Um, sure enough, that happened and their marriage has been very much strengthened just by that time of prayer and that very practical, how do we sanctify our family life? How do we live our vocation to marriage and bring ourselves closer to each other and closer to God? And again, this is at a period of history uh, very recent history, when families don't mm -hmm. set the table and eat together mm -hmm. nearly like when I was a kid, it was yeah. just the absolute norm. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, you didn't go out to anybody's house to hang out with your buddies during dinner time. Mm -hmm. You were at home because mm -hmm. your mom and dad would mm -hmm. kill you for it. Yep. You know? <laughs> I'm very I grateful. I'd dis be disappointed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, I'm grateful I was raised in a family very similar to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a good thing. But it, again, it's very simple. Um, by the way, I have another call. Hello, Anne? Yes. Hi, where are you from? I'm from Montana. Montana, great. And what is your question? My question is, how can we include some of the aspects of that program that you're describing? It sounds wonderful, like the antidote to um, a Catholic identity crisis that we have at our Catholic school. How can we include... I, your, either your whole program or parts of your program in an existing Catholic school. There you go. <laughs> now, you, you get students from Catholic schools yes. coming to your program yes. after school, mm -hmm. right? Yes. What would you recommend to Anne mm -hmm. as a way to introduce some of this in a Catholic school? Mm -hmm. I would say one of human virtue is necessary at Catholic schools. I think often we don't see the importance for character education within Catholic schools because we have so much Christian formation. But um, our Christian formation is very much supplemented by character. And so there are many great materials. I recently just learned of, for high school students, uh, principles and choices, which brings through a lot of philosophy into character education. It's the name of a program. Okay. Um, Principles and choices. And choices. Um, but then, where, where is that available from? You can find it on the website. I don't exactly know where it is, but if you type that in, it will come out. And 
but I think in general, living virtue yourself and being an example and trying to be very attractive because kids are attracted to beauty, kids are attracted to elegance. And so when you present yourself in an attractive way and you're living virtue, they're gonna very naturally want to do the things that you're doing and learn from you what it is like, what's behind that? And then they'll start to get to know through that as well. Another caller. Hello, Patty. Patty, are you there? I, is Patty Hello. there? Hello? Hi, Patty. How are you? Hello. I'm fine. Thank you, Father. Good. We lost you there a second. Oh. <laughs> where are you from? I'm from um, Arizona. Great. Is that where you're from? Yes. I'm yes. from Arizona, yes. Um, my, quest, my, qu my question is... Um, is this um, a school that's offering a curriculum from, maybe you explained this in the morning, or in the um, beginning, and I didn't, wasn't attentive, but um, is this program just a supplement to schools, or did you offer a curriculum of all classes at, from like 8 in the morning until 3, and then who, who's paying for this? Who's, where are the, where's the funding coming from? Do these kids pay tuition? Is it... Um, attached to public to uh, federal fund public funding of any kind okay now I have to turn on the TV and listen I guess. oh th thank you Patty uh, so first of Patty's questions is is this uh, an eight to three school program it is not we do have schools that members of Opus Dei have started on their own initiative that are schools nine to five or eight to three whatever the hours are midtown and metro is a supplementary education program and so during the school year we're after school and in the summer we're all day every day okay all right now who pays for all this you get are you getting money from the government um no i didn't think so uh too much virtue <laughs> <laughs> so um if you're not getting money from the government bad boy uh, but the if you're not giving money from the government uh, it doesn't just sort of float out of the no, air either How do you, where, where does the money come from for this so we have a fundraising team that works very hard at finding grants working with corporations in Chicago who are very civically responsible and want to help uh. the inner city and then a lot of individual donations as well um, it's a challenge. I'm very grateful that I don't have to work in the fundraising department, but I do have to balance our budget on the girls' side, so I'm very aware of when we don't have what we need, how it directly affects the students. Sure. You know, and it's, it's something, uh, you know, I've done programs here before about the Cristo Ray schools, yes, yes. Uh, one the two in Chicago. And um, it's also businesses and corporations mm -hmm. that have a sense the future yeah. of the the city depends on students who know something that they can later on hire mm -hmm. you know so that's god bless them mm -hmm. for doing that now real quickly i'll have a couple minutes but uh you took some girls to the march for life in washington yes, dc how did that go <laughs> it was great um there were many big transformations something that um, you're going to see more and more with this age group and younger is the way they learn is through experiencing something so many of these students have been raised with Planned Parenthood as their educators on sex within the schools and as a matter of fact if they're African Americans um, it, it's something like 60 percent of Planned Parenthood's uh, abortion clinics are in African American neighborhoods mm -hmm. Uh, which, yeah. you, you know, even though they're only 13% yeah. of the population, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, on our trip, so we work with low-income minority sure. students who are a huge target of abortion. So on our trip, we found out that many of the students that were with us, um, that their father or their grandfather was really pushing for them to be aborted, and their mom stayed strong and kept the child, and... Here they are, great and amazing. And, and so, not only, but certainly pro-life because they're survivors mm -hmm. well, of they, abortion. I mean, yes, you would be shocked, though, because there's sort of this 
they don't really think about the issue. Their friends are having abortions regularly. Many yeah. of them have had multiple abortions, yes. so they just don't take a stance on it. Yeah. And most of them stated that they were pretty apathetic to the issue until they saw the reality by going to the Holocaust Museum, seeing like the Dred Scott case and right. the marches from Martin Luther King and putting mm -hmm. it all together. Good job. Good job. Well, thank you both for the great work you're doing. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. it very much. And I want to give you all a blessing. Almighty God bless you and keep you, cause His face to shine upon you. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, we can let you know about the good news of things that young ladies such as these and many other programs that we do. We can do it because you make it possible. This is your network, and it's your support that keeps us going. So we please urge you to keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill, and then we'll be able to pay our bills too. Thank you, and God bless.